Jemima Kirk is one of my oldest friends, and she's also one of the stars of my TV show, Girls. That can get complicated. We recently took a four-hour car ride from Wyoming to Colorado and talked about the history of our friendship. We took one break at a place called The Friendly Store, where Jemima bought a carton of cigarettes because the price was good, though the people weren't actually that friendly. Hi, Jemima. Hi, Lena. Where are we right now? We are driving down the I-80, I think, or maybe 275. Yeah. Um, and we are driving from Laramie to Denver to catch a flight back to New York. Yes, we are. This is actually the first time in our entire relationship that you've driven me, and I was nervous, but you're good. I am good, right? Yeah, I'm impressed. Yeah. So we just spent a long, reflective weekend together. We did. It was a real... It was really uh, an, an intensive bonding experience. We even did a ropes course. We did a ropes course that you shimmied up like it was no big deal. And at one point, someone said, she didn't even act like she knew how to do a ropes course. Look at all, and she, her hair's down. Look at all her blonde hair flying. And I went, this is what it's like to be friends with this person. Like, she was nine months pregnant, and we walked down the street, and men hit on her. Like, that's just what <laughs> life is. Thanks. Um, so this episode of Women of the Hour, mm-hmm. my podcast, mm-hmm. is about friendship. Oh, interesting. And you and I have been <laughs> friends for, can you count, I tell people that we've been friends for almost 20 years. Okay, let me think about that. Almost, yeah, that well. Okay, so uh, we were in, I was in middle school. We were in middle school, let's say fifth grade. Yeah, I was in That's fifth sense. and you were in sixth when we We have met. known each other for almost 20 years, yes. Yeah, because now you're 30 and I'm 29. And yeah. when we met, I was 11 and you were 12. Right. One of the things I wanted to focus on talking to you, obviously a lot of people have friends that they've had for a long time. <laughs> A lot of people, and you and I have an interesting thing because we're incredibly close. Mm-hmm. We know each other really well. Mm-hmm. We have a shared history, mm-hmm. and we work together. Yeah. And sometimes it's there's caused, the doozy. <laughs> sometimes it's caused some arguments. Yeah, it's hard, and I get asked that question a lot in interviews, and it's a complicated answer. It's not so great, you know. It's not. It, it is a. It's great at times. There's some amazing things about working with your with your best friend, and that is that you. You know, you feel you can voice your concerns or things you're excited about, you know, in a sort of personal setting and you feel like things are being honored and respected even if they're said, being said no to, whatever it is. Yeah. I feel and like I don't have to hide my emotions as the way I might as a boss with someone else. Like if right. you're having an incredibly hard day, I right. can go into your dressing room and cry, which frankly I'm not going to do to Adam Driver. Right. Yeah, and we can go into each other's rooms and be like, ugh. Yeah, I like um, when you woke, went into my room, took a Polaroid of yourself, and wrote "fuck you" on it. And left it there. <laughs> I'm always going into your dressing room when you're not there, and they always try and stop me. And I'm like, "It's okay, she's my friend." <laughs> and <laughs> here's my question: So, I feel like looking back in the history of our fights, tell me if this narrative makes sense to you. When people ask like about your friendship with Jemima, mm-hmm. I say that basically through high school, I would have done anything you said. I was your slave, and I followed you everywhere you went. Mm-hmm. That is my narrative of it. I don't know if you have a shared narrative. I wanted to wear your clothes, be in your life. The only time I didn't do what you said is when you told me we were leaving for St. Bart's the next day and my mom was like, no, you're not. <laughs> but yeah. Well, I that was my MO. That's sort of the kinds of people I, I created around myself. I wanted a crowd like that. And I, so I picked and chose people I thought would do those things and you, you liked die. to do a cult of personality type yeah I, 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 I found a, a, a sort of vulnerable area in someone I was like you're gonna be right my friend and then after the break in our friendship because I'd say when we were like when I was 18 and you were 19 we were really close and then our lives shifted I went to college in Ohio you mm-hmm. went off to do some other stuff we met back up again in 2008 our personalities had developed and suddenly like we were incredibly close, and I was still deeply enamored of you, but I wasn't quite the listener that the I'd been The playing before. field had leveled. Yes, but and not just level. No, level's the wrong word, because you were also... I was also seeing in you, uh, you know, an incredibly intelligent and, uh, and self-made... Even before anything with girls happened, I, just, I was seeing things aside of you that I was intimidated by. And that was important for me to... to build up my, you know, adoration for you. But I have a question for you. Okay. What did it feel like to put me in, to put me in your show and then create this, this other element to our relationship of, of, uh, 
of, of sort of you being the creator and me being the sort of fulfiller of that. Do you know what I mean? Do you think there was something cathartic about that? I actually think there was something cathartic because my whole high school relationship to you was viewing you as this whole, like, I mean, for context, for our listeners, you were incredibly precocious, incredibly beautiful. You were the person who was like going out to a club when we were 15 and like new adults and new right. fucking, you know, went to your house and Moby was there, <laughs> like fucking eating a salad. The and greatest I was just, celebrity of all time. The greatest celebrity of all time. But it was like, to me, you were everything that a person, a high school woman should be. I was like overweight had acne, had never even kissed someone, and you had this like glamour and ease, like like I just didn't even understand right. how a person could be high school age to be that way. And so then I think like you always were kind of an artwork to me, and it's weird because actually starting to work with you and see where your insecurities lay, mm -hmm. like actually like humanized you for me in a big way. Right, yeah, it sort of set you free from that a little bit, so, and me, frankly. But I felt like, when we were younger, we had a friend, we never fought, partially because I never said no to you. Right. <laughs> and then our, one thing that was hard was once we started working together, partially it was being adult, but partially it was our life shifting, we did start fighting. And I had this worry that like, yeah. I had created this character for you at the expense of our like, loving, connected friendship. Yeah, I think that, you know, you created this character for me and I feel like I, at times maybe I felt like I was being, Turned into a caricature. Turned turn into a caricature because I know you write from life a lot. But I sometimes felt like, oh, like this isn't, is this who she thinks I am? You know, and, and I would act out on that sometimes before during we get in fights. Um, but, you know, my rational mind is like, no, it's not. We have a friendship now outside of this. Um, and I know she doesn't think this is who I am. No, I just felt like there was a way that you were, you were sort of, uh, summing me up into a caricature and that was like an easier way to like have power over me and that's where I would get annoyed and then I would get I feel like I was out of, like I didn't have any control and I was just I, then I just had to say things like okay this is not my show I'm just a spoke in the wheel of a bigger machine and whatever and I, I have totally moved away from that by fighting with you from fighting with you and talking it out with you all those fights were so necessary I know and is. I regret so many things that I said to you I regret so many things I said to you <laughs> I mean the first I would say the moment because do you remember after first season of the show you called me and you were like I don't want to do this anymore yeah you were like I don't want to do this anymore I'm not an actor this makes me feel embarrassed I have children I don't and I guess the, uh, the actor thing was like me hopping on I'm not an actor I'm not an actor so I was, I was also feeling like I'm not an actor, so I'm being used here. I'm being yeah. used because, like, this thing that Lena knows me so well, and she's using this stuff for her writing, and that was, and that was a very brief moment. And so I felt I had to protect myself um, and get out, but I really had nothing to protect myself from. It was only, it, it was all a matter of perspective. But I remember when that happened, my reaction wasn't like "fuck you, you want to leave the show." My no. reaction was like, my reaction was like. Oh God, I've done something and I've disrupted my friend's life and I, get, I did something I thought would be beautiful for us and it turned out not to be. And I'm like Dr. Frankenstein and I created a monster and now yeah. she's in hell so and it's I, my fault. For, so yes, you felt like because I was saying I don't have time to be with my kids, I don't have time to paint, I don't want to do any press, I hate this, I just I, I, I just want to do the acting part, I don't, want to, I don't even want to do the acting part. But none of that was your, this, that was all my responsibility. It was also me um, having an identity issue fully. It was me being like, now I'm an actor, now everyone's gonna see. It was at me being selfish and thinking only about my image. Not, and, and if I stop to think, do I really enjoy this? Separate from what it, what other effects it has on my life? Yes, I do, I enjoy acting, I enjoy the process, I enjoy being around you and working with you. But I didn't, couldn't see that for the trees. I could only see that it was ruining what my blueprint of what I wanted to my, my image to be. I was going to ask you if you could guess. In my brain, I have a moment that I consider to be the worst moment in our friendship. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you have the same one. Okay, go ahead. Which one? Do you want to guess first? Oh, I'll guess. Uh, I know it. What I is think it? I know it. What is it? That photo shoot with, um, for me, the oh. photo shoot with Autumn. That, in the park? Yeah. That was really sad. That was so sad. 
That was so sad. That was I so arri- It was right after I told you I was pregnant, right? No, it was no, before I hadn't you, told you hadn't told me you were pregnant, and that has to do with the worst moment, which is, for viewers, for listeners who don't know, <laughs> Jemima has two children, yeah. ages four and two. They're lovely. And I chose to punish Lena because I was mad at her by not by making her one of the last people I told that I was pregnant. And I did that for fully. the second time. For Whereas the second. for the first the first time she got pregnant, I was the first person before she told I even me. told my husband. Yeah, basically. she told she called me in the morning at seven a.m. and said I'm pregnant and I haven't told Mike yet. Yeah. And so when you didn't tell me yeah, you were I did pregnant, that totally intentionally to hurt you. It was so painful. I remember sitting in my office at the at Silver Cup, mm-hmm. and you called and you said I'm pregnant, and I said how pregnant, and you said four months, and I started I look at chills to I can't weep. And I just was like, what has happened yeah. that you were, you were pregnant enough, like, that you knew it was a boy. Yeah. And I was like, what has happened in our lives that we would go from, I'd be the person who's talking to you, trying to figure out if you're even going to have your baby. It was me going through all that stuff I just said of, like, not having trust for you and that I not, not giving, just, just not seeing, I, I, I misread everything. Well, we, when she said the worst photo shoot, we did the photo shoot. The first press we ever did for girls was a cover for New York Magazine. They flew all the girls out to LA. And Jemima and I hadn't been talking that much because. But, and I hadn't, and I'd been like not calling and sort of resenting and for whatever it was, and not calling and not picking up calls or whatever, and then sort of being mad that she didn't call me enough, even though I wasn't going to pick up anyway. And then, and then I got there and. I was cold because that's what I do. Um, and Lena was, Lena was happy to see me and very sweet. And then you told me, I don't know if it was a few days later, or a week later, you were like, I have, was struggling so hard that week before or the few days before the photo shoot and you weren't calling me, you weren't picking up my calls and I needed you so badly and all I wanted when you showed up to that photo shoot was you and all I got was a, was a cold shoulder. And it was just, it was, it broke my heart because I was like, yeah, I just wanted, I, I, I don't know why I did that. I mean, but I it do broke know. my heart because I knew that I had somehow made you think that my only priority was to get the show done no yeah. matter what and because of you feeling like my only priority was work, you didn't feel like I was a safe place to share your pregnancy until the moment you would be like comfortable telling someone at the grocery store. Right, but there was also a selfishness to it because you know what? Instead of thinking about why isn't Lena checking on me, 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 why don't you just, even if you know you do disagree or with something your friend does, you have to check up on your friend and just see how they're doing. And I didn't for a second think I should do that. And what I mean is, like, I missed out that that was a horrible few months or weeks for you. Because I wasn't, because I was thinking about how you were treating me. But you weren't treating me anyway, except you weren't being a present for me. Because you couldn't at that moment. You were wrapped up in your own fucking OCD and whatever it was you were going through. Anxiety. Anxiety. And how are the directions going? Jemima's very deftly navigating her way to Denver as we do this conversation. (laughs) I'm going to turn right in exactly 29 miles, which sounds like forever. And then we, f- we fixed it, and I was there the day that your baby was born, and I came and I helped him, and it was mm-hmm. beautiful. But we continued to have issues around me prioritizing work and you feeling like our friendship and our ability, like, feeling like we never just sat on the couch anymore. And fucking, I used to go over to your house, and we would watch, like, celebrity rehab and, like, eat vegan right. cookies. And, and that just stopped I was part having of a hard time with Lena it, having a TV show, having having this and I felt like you know the tv show or the work just work writing whatever it was took precedence over friendships and I think I do think it did and I think that's something you have to manage that you do manage and you're managing it beautifully now in your life it's trying doing great then you won and that's okay that that was part of your struggle and your process that you're you are a workaholic and not in like you're in a good way I wrote some text to you this is something I really regret saying. You were like, you wrote me some text where you were like, you never come over. We never see each other when it's not work. I don't consider that a real friendship. So if that's what our friendship's going to be from now on, I can just accept it. But that to me isn't what counts as friendship. Right. And then you basically were like, maybe we should take a break. Oh God. 
and which I get. And then I, I remember writing back to you like, how could you say this to me? Every week I write a love letter to you. And you were like, go fuck yourself. <laughs> you were like, like you, you do not write a love letter to me. And you, you were right. Like, I know, sh- but I know what, yes, it was, uh, it, it wasn't true what you were saying, but I, but it was a, but your intent, your your intentions were true. They were were sincere, which they means were, you just didn't want me to go, and you didn't. You would say anything to make it so that I wasn't angry at you, and you meant that not because you just want to be in the clear, but because you wanted the relationship to be right. And when we're in those modes, we'll say anything that sounds that's not true. Well, I also want, and I wanted, and this will come in time, and I believe that you're working towards this, and I'm. And I'm working towards accepting that you're working towards it. Yeah. Is the just the casual hangout? I think you know, if not the squeezing in between appointments. And I know there are times in people's careers and lives where they do have to do that. I have kids. I have to squeeze people in too. So that's also my work in this in our friendship is to have compassion for that. I also think it's really great. You became a mother. I mean, it's not young for medieval times. You were 24, but that was young for, like, we went to the kind of school where they were like, when you're 43, you can start to think about a child. (laughs) But I think it was a huge adjustment for me, honestly. This sounds so ridiculous. Like, it wasn't until last year that I looked at you and I was like, holy shit, Jemima's the mom of two people, and that takes precedence over anything else she will ever do in her life. But I was like, oh my God, you're not, we're never going to, be able to say to each other like I would die without you because it's like no. that exists but at the end of the day you're you're a mom yeah and also there were moments where I tried to say to you like I get it you're a mom I run a business but the right. fact is it's like <laughs> those two things aren't the same no they're not they're not the same no but they they both require an immense amount of responsibility an immense amount of headspace when you wish it was it wasn't in your head. I want, was saying to someone, Jemima and I fight a lot, but I realized it was kind of just one long fight. Listen, in all love relationships, every fight is always essentially the same fight. It's true. It's it. Aside from bickering, even bickering actually, it's all falls under the umbrella of something of of like your guys's one trigger towards each other. Um, I thought a good way to end this would be to lovingly tell each other the most annoying things about each other. Oh, perfect. Are you excited? Yeah. You can start. <laughs> the most annoying things... Are, okay, well, I'll start with the and way... Don't say something mean like you have too much trauma around your rape or something. <laughs> <laughs> no. I was going to start with something super light. Okay. Which is that last night you're snoring is the most annoying thing I've ever heard. <laughs> what do you mean? It's like... Is it like it? It's like... A, I was like, what are you doing? I was just the weirdest noise. And I bumped, gave you a slight nudge, and you were like, what? Like, <laughs> so quick. And I was like, you're snoring. You're like, oh, my God, I'm so sorry. You were too, though. You were. <laughs> you were snoring, like, loudly, and I had to literally turn you over like you were an old dead man. <laughs> um, another annoying thing about you. Oh, you check out in your head when sometimes when in conversations. Not necessarily to me. Like it's not it's not annoying. It's just interesting because you do it when you you talk. It can be annoying. I saw you do it on the Ellen show. You did see me. You saw me stare into the abyss on the Ellen. I was watching Ellen. I was like, oh, she's gone. She's gone. Lights are on. No one's home. <laughs> <laughs> and I pointed it out, and my husband was like, Yeah, 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 totally. Yeah. Um, what's another annoying thing? There are gotta be more. You tell me mine, and I'll think okay. more. I'll tell you a few. I'm gonna go from least to most okay least is that you like to do things that you know are going to gross people out in their home space like you like to like have a cigarette in a no smoking zone or like squeeze a giant zit onto someone's couch like you enjoy creating you enjoy like leaving a trace of yourself Mm -hmm. in a way that's very like pissed off nine-year-old boy yeah like anytime you leave my house i just find like a weird pair of underwear and like Mm -hmm. like a blood stain and like a fucking cigarette butt on my windowsill yeah yeah it's true (laughs) sometimes when we especially when we're around people we don't know that well you'll like say a mean thing to like indicate our familiarity but it will make me feel embarrassed okay yeah i know you've told me that yeah it's progressing into the worst of me right now and i'm Um, I'm liking it go ahead obviously your text messages are curt and so i always think you're angry at me because you write back okay or fine but I'm learning. Yes, but I'm learning too. And I'm using a lot more emojis and exclamation points and warming them right up. 
But when you did once use an exclamation point, then I thought you were mad at me, so you kind of can't win. I know, but I'm get, but I'm, but you were just not used to it, and I, I understood yeah. that. And I really think that's the most of it. The, the only other thing is that when you're, you and I have a different thing, which is when you're really upset, I want to talk it out in that moment, and you want to go into your area. Yeah. So I'm chasing you and chasing you and being like, but what's going on? Can we fix this? And you're like, right. just leave me the fuck alone. Right. And yeah, you yeah. won't answer phone calls, and I'll call your landline, then I'll call your house line, and phone, it's your cell phone. Mm-hmm. And I'll be like, I know she's home, and I know she's screening my call, and to me it's like the rudest. And I also really recognize that forcing you to make up with me is selfishness incarnate, and that you need to be able to do it in your on your own timeline. Right. But yeah. this is all said, like, with, my, with a feeling that I have that you're literally the best person that's ever lived. Same. Thanks. Last night I was, as we were going to sleep, I'll leave it with this, I was t- talking a lot to Jemima. And finally she was like, ugh, go <laughs> to bed. I'm like, that's great, Lena. Mm-hmm. Go to sleep. <laughs> she talk, Lena talks a lot during sleepovers. That's, right. that's, my, that's my other annoying thing, but I like it too. Well, you said you were like, it's fine because I'm not listening. <laughs> Which is a good response. (laughs) Talk as much as you want. I'm not listening. (laughs) Thank you for listening. We're back on Thursday with a full episode. Love you, Jim. me in your show and then create this this other element to our relationship of of, uh, of of sort of you being the creator and me being the sort of fulfiller of that. Do you know what I mean? Do you think there was something cathartic about that? I actually think there was something cathartic because my whole high school relationship to you was viewing you as this whole, like, I mean, for context, for our listeners, you were incredibly precocious incredibly beautiful you were the person who was like going out to a club when we were 15 and like new adults and new right. fucking you know went to your house and moby was there like <laughs> fucking eating a salad the and i was just a celebrity of all time the greatest celebrity of all time but it was like to me you were everything that a person a high school woman should be i was like overweight had acne had never even kissed someone and you had this like glamour and ease like like i just didn't even understand right how a person could be high school age to be that way and so then I think like you always were kind of an artwork to me and it's weird because actually starting to work with you and see where your insecurities lay Mm -hmm. like actually like humanized you for me in a big way right yeah it sort of set you free from that a little bit and me frankly but I felt like when we were younger we had a friend we never fought partially because I never said no to you right (laughs) and then our One thing that was hard was once we started working together, partially it was being adult, but partially it was our life shifting, we did start fighting. And I had this worry that, like, I had created this character for you at the... Oh, interesting. And you and I have been (laughs) friends for... Can you count... I tell people that we've been friends for almost 20 years. Okay, let me think about that. Almost... Yeah, that well... Okay, so uh, we were in... I was in middle school. We were in middle school, let's say fifth... Great. Yeah, I was in That's fifth sense. and you were in sixth. When we, we have met. known each other for almost 20 years. Yes. Yeah, because now you're 30 and I'm 29. And yeah. when we met, I was 11 and you were 12. Right. One of the things I wanted to focus on talking to you, obviously a lot of people have friends that they've had for a long time. <laughs> a lot of people, and you and I have an interesting thing because we're incredibly close. Mm-hmm. We know each other really well. Mm-hmm. We have a shared history mm-hmm. and we work together. Yeah. And sometimes it's There's the doozy. <laughs> sometimes it's caused some arguments. Yeah, it's hard, and I get asked that question a lot in interviews, and it's a complicated answer. It's not so great, you know. It's not. It is a. It's great at times. There are some amazing things about working with your with your best friend, and that is that you, you know, you feel you can voice your concerns or things you're excited about, you know, in a sort of personal setting and you feel like things are being honored and respected even if they're said, being said no to or whatever it is. Yeah. I feel and like I don't have to hide my emotions as the way I might as a boss with someone else. Like if right. you're having an incredibly hard day, I right. can go into your dressing room and cry, which frankly I'm not going to do to Adam Driver. Right. Yeah, and we can go into each other's rooms and be like, ugh. Yeah, I like um, when you woke, went into my room, took a Polaroid of yourself and wrote fuck you on it and left it there. <laughs> I'm always going into your dressing room when you're not there and they always try and stop me and I'm like, it's okay, she's my friend. <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> Here's my question. So I feel the expense 
of our like loving connected friendship yeah I think that you know you created this character for me and I feel like I, at times maybe I felt like I was being turned into a caricature turned, turned into a caricature because I know you write from life a lot but I sometimes felt like oh like this isn't is this who she thinks I am you know and, and I would act out on that sometimes before dream we get in fights um but you know my rational mind is like no it's not we have a friendship now outside of this um and I know she doesn't think this is who I am no, I just felt like there was a way that you were you were sort of uh, summing me up into a caricature and that was like an easier way to like have power over me and that's where I would get annoyed and then I would get I feel like I was out of, like I didn't have any control and I was just I, then I just had to say things like okay this is not my show I'm just a spoke in the wheel of a bigger machine and whatever and I just, I have totally moved away from that by fighting with you from fighting with you and talking it out with you all those fights were so necessary I know and I regret so many things that I said to you I regret so many things I said to you <laughs> I mean the first I would say the moment because do you remember after first season of the show you called me and you were like I don't want to do this anymore yeah you were like I don't want to do this anymore I'm not an actor this makes me feel embarrassed I have children I don't and I guess the, uh, the actor thing was like me hopping on there. I'm not an actor I'm not an actor so I was, I was also feeling like I'm not an actor, so I'm being used here. I'm being yeah. used because, like, this thing that Lena knows me so well, and she's using this stuff for her writing, and that was, and like, looking back in the history of our fights, tell me if this narrative makes sense to you. When people ask, like, you're about your friendship with Jemima, I say that basically through high school, I would have done anything you said, I was your slave, and I followed you everywhere you went. Mm -hmm. That is my narrative of it. I don't okay. know if you have a shared narrative. I wanted to wear your clothes, be in your life, the only time I didn't do what you said is when you told me we were leaving for St. Bart's the next day and my mom was like, no, you're not. <laughs> but, yeah. well, I, that was my MO. That's sort of the kinds of people I, I created around myself. I wanted a crowd like that. And I, so I picked and choose people I thought would do those things. And you, you liked to do a cult of personality. Type yeah. Of I, 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 I found a, a, a sort of vulnerable area in someone I was like, you're going to be right. my friend. And then after the break in our friendship, because I'd say when we were, like, when I was 18 and you were 19, we were really close, and then our lives shifted. I went to college in Ohio. Mm -hmm. You went off to do some other stuff. We met back up again in 2008. Our personalities had developed, and suddenly, like, we were incredibly close, and I was still deeply enamored of you, but I wasn't quite the listener that the I'd been The playing field had leveled. Yes, but and not just level. No, level's the wrong word, because you were also... I was also seeing in you, uh, you know, an incredibly intelligent and uh, and self-made. Even before anything with girls happened, I, just, I was seeing things aside of you that I was intimidated by, and that was important for me to to build up my you know adoration for you. But I have a question for you. Okay. What did it feel like? Jemima Kirk is one of my oldest friends, and she's also one of the stars of my TV show, Girls. That can get complicated. We recently took a four-hour car ride from Wyoming to Colorado and talked about the history of our friendship. We took one break at a place called The Friendly Store, where Jemima bought a carton of cigarettes because the price was good, though the people weren't actually that friendly. Hi, Jemima. Hi, Lena. Where are we right now? We are driving down the I-80, I think, or maybe 275. Yeah. Um, and we are driving from Laramie to Denver to catch a flight back to New York. Yes, we are. This is actually the first time in our whole entire relationship that you've driven me, and I was nervous, but you're good. I am good, right? Yeah, I'm impressed. Yeah. So we just spent a long, reflective weekend together. We did. It was a real... It was really uh, an, an intensive bonding experience. We even did a ropes course. We did a ropes course that you shimmied up like it was no big deal. And at one point, someone said, she didn't even act like she knew how to do a ropes course. Look at all her, and she, her hair's down. Look at all her blonde hair flying. And I went, this is what it's like to be friends with this person. Like, she was nine months pregnant, and we walked down the street, and men hit on her. Like, that's just what <laughs> life is. Thanks. Um, so this episode of Women of the Hour, mm -hmm. my podcast, mm -hmm. is about friendship. 